morning. Would you stand and join together in our gathering song, Bind Us Together, Lord? Oh. Sign the what register or the register there by on your pew. I appreciate that to kind of keep track of who's here. There's guests here today. We certainly appreciate that. Are there any announcements that we need to make today? I see a couple. Yeah, Bruce is going Bruce up first. Is Good morning, everyone. So next Sunday is our fifth Sunday. That means strings attached will be safe playing here again. And we invite you to come about 15 minutes early for a sing-along. So next Sunday, about 8.45, we'll see you all here for a sing of about four songs, and then we'll start the service at 9. Thank you. Georgia. <coughs> Service today. We talked about our 2023 budget as well as uh, fundraisers this year. So we really, really encourage you to stay. We would like to know your input. Thank you. Just in case you couldn't hear that, United. Oh, sorry, whatever. <laughs> I try, I try, I really do. Um, the United Methodist Women or the Women United in Faith or United Women in Faith, I really am trying, are meeting right after the service today, and I will remind you as the service ends. Okay, go ahead. Yay, it's going to work. Woohoo! So, what's this Friday? It's our roller skating party. Woohoo! You don't have to skate, you can just come watch. Um, there's going to be Little Caesars Pizza. It's at Mattoon Silver Star Roller Rink on Route 45 in Mattoon. Um, it's a lovely rink. It's a safe rink. It's got uh, lots of stuff for the kids to do. There's uh, neon golf that is in included, and it's free to get in. Uh, it costs a dollar for skate rental. You do have to do that. Um, I am going to have a donation thing at the front door um, just for, you know, us. But anyway, it's, uh, it's going to be fun. We had a blast last year, an absolute blast. And um, no injuries. We don't no, want any injuries. Here, no no <laughs> so, broken arms. Yeah, no broken arms. So join us this Friday from 6 to 9, uh, and I think it's just going to be a lovely time. Thank you. And even if you don't skate, last time Leighton and I went and played mini golf and we had a blast. It's glow in the dark mini golf. I've never done that in my life and I would go back and do it again. It was great fun. So please come out. You just you cannot believe the joy that you'll see there. Are there any other announcements? Then let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship as we turn to the to Kathy to play the prelude and invite God's presence here among us.
join with me in our call to worship. Please stand, and I'll be reading the whole print to start with. It's backwards on the thing. He'll be reading what says congregation. You'll be reading the other. It just happened. Our world offers many wide avenues and beautiful boulevards to walk. God invites us to walk the road of service and sacrifice. Our society suggests we put down our roots in the shallow soil of pleasure and greed. Our God seeks to plant us on the banks of hope, watered by the rivers of joy and grace. Our culture promotes achievement, success, climbing to the top, ringing the bell. Our God tells us if we want to be first, we need to go to the end of the line. Chocolate ice cream, so I need to be at the front 
to get exactly what I want. Yeah. So Bronwyn is giving my children's message for me today because she's awesome. She just said, but you really should be at the end and be kind and let other people have their choice first. And that's what makes me so happy to hear because Jesus said the same thing. Jesus said something crazy. He said, those of you who are the first should be the last. He says, when you line up, you should be at the end of the line and give other people a choice first. Is this easy to do? So today, I'm going to offer you a sticker. And I'm going to let you choose. There's only so many stickers of each kind. And I'm going to have you line up. Oh, this is going to be fun. To pick your sticker. And so I'm going to have you line up right here in front of me to pick up your sticker. Come on over here if you want to get a sticker. Come on, you guys can come. <laughs> Good girls, come on, you got it. You get to pick your sticker. What sticker do you want? You want a glittery one? All right. Oh, you want me here? Let me get it. I can go a little faster. Here you go. Your hands. She got an ambulance. That's cool, and it's sparkly. What about you? You can pick at the same time. You guys choose together. So we're, yeah, police car's pretty cool. What do you want? School bus. Want a school bus? Your sister wants you to get the school bus, doesn't she? Yeah. All right, Ramsey and David, you guys want to look at pet? Charlie's smart. All right. Police car. Ramsey gets a police car. Another police car for David. And Bronwyn, who I know would have been at the last, but she let Charlie go last because she's really sweet. And you don't like stickers, okay? <laughs> It's easy to be last in line. So I'm going to say Bronwyn is last. So Bronwyn, because you're last, I'm going to let you pick two stickers. Because God rewards us if we're last. <laughs> I'll let you look and pick while I'm... So everybody, this is the, the, the thing. It was, we should always try to be last and let others have what is wonderful, but you know, sometimes it's really hard. Sometimes we want to be at the front of the line. So we pray to God to make us strong enough to let ourselves be last. Can we say a quick prayer? Dear Lord, help us to want to be last. Amen. All right, I see Miss Cheryl and Miss Brittany are back there to take you guys to Children's Church and any other kids of the grade who would like to go to Children's Church are welcome to. It's a lot of fun. I invite the ushers to come forward as we prepare our hearts and minds to take the morning tithes and offerings. Would you please come? <laughs>
pray, Thank God. You. We ask that you bless these tithes and offerings that the people have made. We pray that they can be used wisely in spreading the good news of Jesus Christ in our church, in our community, and around the world. In his name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Our first passage of scripture this morning comes from Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human kind likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself, and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bend, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, and the glory of God the Father. This is the word of God for the people of God. As we move into our time of pastoral prayer, I have a short letter to read to you from uh, Sarah Evans, our uh, wonderful office admin. She's had a very busy week this week, and she wanted to share some words with you. The last two years have been rough, to say the least. I will have to be honest. There were times I questioned my faith and was asking God, why me? Why must I go through everything I've gone through? And over the last two weeks, I've gotten my answers. I've also gotten my revelation to my star word, which was silence. I listened to silence. I listened to unanswered prayers for Nathan and his happiness, and unanswered prayers to Chelsea and Mai's IVF struggles. However, as of today, Nathan is doing fantastic at Lincoln's Challenge. I watched him graduate from candidate to cadet yesterday at acclamation graduation. He's enjoying every bit of Lincoln's Challenge and is very excited for all changes and adventures to come. Lincoln's Challenge has been the answer to our prayers for Nathan's happiness. And then if we can go to a slide. And as to the IVF struggles, Chelsea and I welcome to the world the most perfect little boy, Rhett Jameson, on Thursday, January 19th. He weighs 8.9 pounds, is 21 inches long. Rhett is our answer to our prayers. He's everything we needed to complete our family, and we can't wait to introduce him to everyone. So we uh, are joining in uh, prayers of praise. Uh, Rhett is spending, spends a little bit of time in the NICU, but he's out now. However, they're going to stay in Champaign, uh, close to the hospital for a week or so, just in case they have a housing program there. Uh, but other than that, he is healthy and happy and ready to meet you all. So uh, we are thrilled. Does anyone else have a prayer request or a praise they'd like to share? Then let's go to God in a time of prayer. And today we're going to do something just a little different. I wanted to do a responsive prayer today. So those of you who have ever been to a Catholic church, this will feel very familiar. But I will say repeatedly throughout the prayer, Lord, in your mercy. And when I say that, just answer back, hear our prayer. So Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Christ, we pray today that you would hear our prayers and graft in our minds the same mind that is in you, that we might be vessels of your humility and grace. Lord Jesus, you emptied yourself, trading in the form of God for the form of a slave. We pray for the church and all her people and ministers, form us into a church that empties itself for others and for you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Lord Jesus, you were born in human likeness and found in human form. We pray today for the whole human family, for the nations of the earth and for all who live in the midst of disaster, famine, or terror. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. 
Lord Jesus, even after humbling yourself in your incarnation, you humbled yourself even to the point of death. We pray for our nation, our leaders, and all the people who live within these borders. Bless us with your humility. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Lord Jesus, your humility and your love for us was so broad and so deep, it cost you your life. We pray for those we love who have died. And as you were highly exalted, May they rest with you in glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. In your exaltation, O Lord, you were given the name above all names. We pray in your name for those who are poor, those who are hungry, those who are hurting. Give them grace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We also pray in your name, O Lord, for those who are sick among us today, those in your hearts that you didn't name out loud, but I know you feel. Give them the gift of healing, strength, and life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And now in the name of the one who humbled himself in the manger, humbled himself on the cross, O Lord, we bend our knee and pray this prayer that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Would you please stand and join in our hymn? comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9. Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them, and taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. That was the word from the Gospel of Mark. Before I begin my sermon, I want to remind you we're working through the book by Thomas uh, Tom, excuse me, Rainier. Uh, I am a church member, and we're going to close out this sermon series with welcoming some new members to our church on February tw uh, 12th. 
If you would like to join, it is very, very a very easy process. Just let me know uh, at the end of church today, and I will make sure that your name is added, and we will welcome you as a new member uh, to this body of Tuscola United Methodist Church. William Bud Post got everything he wanted and everything most of us would want when he won 16.2 million dollars in the Pennsylvania lottery all the way back in 1988. Now I don't know what the uh, inflation has done to that but I'm guessing that money is a lot bigger now. However within one year William Bud Post was in debt over a million dollars. He spent $17.2 million in one year. I wish it had never happened, Post said. It was a complete nightmare. So during this time, he was sued by a former girlfriend who claimed she was entitled to a third of the winnings. His brother was arrested for hiring a hitman to kill uh, Bud Post, hoping that he would inherit, uh, sorry, inherit a share of the winnings. Post was encouraged by his family to sink all his money into the family business, which then failed. Post sank into debt and eventually spent time in jail for firing his gun over the head of a bill collector. He told the Washington Post in the 90s, I was much happier when I was broke. After losing all of his money, Bud lived quietly on $450 a month plus food stamps until his death in 2006. Most of us have fantasies, dreams about winning the lottery. What would we do? Of course we'd give most of it away, probably. Definitely, probably. But we don't actually know what we do until we're faced with the moment that all our dreams come true. But according to Daniel Gilbert, a professor in Harvard University's Department of Psychology, we really don't know what we want. You see, Gilbert's specialty is happiness. Did you know you could go to Harvard and take a class on happiness? Apparently you can. And he and his fellow researchers spent a great deal of time and grant money trying to discover what honestly you and I probably could have told them in the first place, which is what we think will make us happy doesn't always make us happy. We think that we will be completely satisfied when we get married to the perfect person. When we buy the perfect car, if we can just redo the kitchen, then I'll be happy. But the problem is, it might make us happy for a short period of time, but it just doesn't last very long. The reason that happens, researchers say, is that our brains adapt much more quickly to short-term satisfaction than they should. So our brains get used to something new and decide it's not that special anymore. And so we move on to the next thing we think will make us happy, thus fueling that endless and usually disappointing pursuit of happiness. That pursuit of happiness asks the question, what do you really want. The disciples who followed Jesus were pretty sure they knew what would make them happy. Every single one of them wanted to be considered the greatest of the group. In one of the Gospels, we find out that some of their mothers were the ones edging, egging them on, trying to get them to ask that. I know none of y'all would do that for your children, would you? These disciples became so convinced that each one of them was the greatest that they actually argued out loud about it as they walked to Capernaum. And when they arrived, Jesus asked them, what have you been arguing about? And they were kind of silent. 
To be honest, I think they were embarrassed to tell him. It's funny because not too long before, these people had been fishermen and tax collectors, hardly members of the who's who of Galilee, and now they're fighting with each other as hard as they can to win for themselves the title of the right hand of the kingdom of heaven. The Harvard psychologist would call this miswanting, assuming that you know what will give you the greatest satisfaction when actually it will not. So Jesus sits them down and he calls them to his side and he tells them some really important truths. He says, whoever really wants to be first will need to become last and servant of all. He asks them, do you see this child whom he gathered in his arms? Don't you love that image? I just, I love the image of Jesus and children. It always makes me smile. And he says, when you welcome one such little one, it's as if you have welcomed me, and not only me, but the one who sent me. Now I have to explain that quickly because in our modern times, we revere children. Children at the birth of, of, of the baby or a, a wonderful ones who come up here for children's moment, they give us joy and energy, but it hasn't always been that way. It used to be that children were so unexpected, they're so not expected to live to adulthood that they weren't really considered people as they were children. And so to do something for a child meant that you may never receive a reward for doing that thing. I could do something amazing for that child and that child cannot pay me back in any way, shape, or form. And so Jesus is saying, when you can welcome somebody who is considered not even a human being yet, and he has no way to pay you back, that's what I'm calling you to do. The funny thing is, even though this was probably one of the lowest relationships, lowest times in his relationship with his followers, Jesus doesn't really seem angry with them. He wants them to be happy, but he knows that their happiness is not going to come through ambition. And so he tells them, you want to be the greatest, has nothing to do with status or fame or wealth. What is greatness? It means being the servant of all. The great paradox of greatness is if you want to be first, you really need to be last. Bennett Sims, an Episcopal bishop, writes in his wonderful book, Servanthood, the paradox of greatness is true not because Jesus said it. Jesus said it because it is true. You see, Jesus teaches the truth. Jesus reveals what James would call wisdom from above. That is the truth that lies at the heart of the created order. This matter of servanthood is true, not just for some of the people, some of the time. It is for all of the people, all of the time. Servanthood, Jesus says, should be the lens with which we look at our life and determine our priorities. This is the path to genuine greatness, whether in your marriage or your partnership, in government, in leadership, in business, or in commerce. Jesus reveals a way of life, not just a religious thing. Do you know that the word servant occurs more than 57 times in the New Testament? Now, a few of those refer to a person who is actually in the job of servant, but the vast majority is telling us that we need to be more servant-like. The problem is, we've heard this term so many times. It was funny when I did the children's moment and I asked the kids, you know, the funny thing about whoever wants to be first, y'all finished it for me. Y'all know this, a first shall be last. I used to have a youth pastor when I was a kid 
who uh, had a shirt that said the last United Methodist Church of Sanford, because uh, he said we should be the last United Methodist Church, not the first. <laughs> We've heard it so many times that like a lot of Jesus' ideas, it's lost its radicalness. That same Bishop Sims that I read a quote from earlier served in Atlanta many years ago, and he writes in his book that he had a conversation with a CEO of a major, major industry in Atlanta, which I assume means Coke or Delta, because I think that's all they have. But he had a meeting with this person, and he said he invited them to come uh, to his staff, with his staff to a seminar on the subject of servant leadership. The CEO responded sharply, what makes you think a corporation has anything to learn from a Sunday school? Taking it out of the church context and putting it in the business context really shows you how crazy the idea actually is. Imagine if the CEO of the company took the smallest salary. Imagine a business being more concerned with lifting up its staff than making a profit. Now, the problem with a business like this is it probably wouldn't stay in business very long. But that's what Jesus is telling us the churches should look like. The funny thing is churches very often try to imitate corporations more than we try to imitate the churches we are called to be in. Because God tells us that churches are a place where no one should ever fight to get their own way. Even Paul says in Ephesians 3, 7, of this gospel, I have become a servant. In his book, I Am a Church Member, Tom Renier tells us that we will never find any joy in church membership when we're constantly struggling to have things our own way. Instead, we will only find joy when we allow ourselves to be last. True joy, Rainier states, means giving up our rights and privileges and serving everyone else. That's, he says, what church membership is all about. Tom Bernier didn't just write this book, he did quite a bit of research. He looked for churches that were identified by uh, either church leaders, conference leaders, or self-identified as inwardly focused churches. Inwardly focused churches, uh, he studied these churches to find out what the problems that they're having. And these are churches he defines as having given up serving beyond their walls. Churches that were focused on making themselves happy and not doing anything outside. Rainier found that these churches usually had a lot of the same problems. They argued over worship. What kind of music? What time? We should have no changes ever. We should have a change every Sunday. Whatever happened in worship caused fights that lasted throughout the week. Another sign, he said, are very long meetings spent discussing details that have nothing to do with the mission of the church. Now, we all have to have some meetings that deal with the finances of the church or things like the condition of the carpet of the church. But the difference is, do we spend hours and hours and hours fighting with each other at these meetings? Or do we look for the right path to follow? These churches also are too focused on their facilities. I don't know if you ever had the room, but my grandmother did. The room in the front of the house that no one was allowed in that had plastic over the chairs. The second our church turns into that, we know we're in trouble. These churches had an inwardly focused budget. A disproportionate amount of their money was used to keep church members comfortable and happy instead of reaching out. He noticed attitudes of entitlement among the members. A lot of members demanded special treatment and made sure they were heard loud and clear. 
Uh, uh, another thing he noted was they had bigger concerns over anything changing than they did about spreading the gospel. He says anger and hostility were common and evangelistic apathy set in. The churches didn't care about sharing their faith. They only cared about keeping the church comfortable for themselves. Now, I am going to go on record as saying I don't see a lot of those things in this church. And all of you can go, Whew. I don't. I don't see a lot of that. I, I see this church as being very good at working together. Uh, I can say from our meetings, we really try to, to hear each other and, and, and work together. But it's important to talk about it because churches are constantly changing. People are coming in and out of churches. You may move to a different church. And these kinds of attitudes can be very contagious. The attitudes of entitlement, when we hear someone else start to complain, we think, well, I need to be louder than them because they're going to get their own way just because they're loud. And instead of playing that game, we need to be aware that's not something we want to get involved in. Church membership, from a biblical perspective, is about giving. It's about putting others first. Last night I was talking to uh, my husband, not about my sermon at all. Somehow we got to talking about childhood traditions, and we both remember our big Sunday dinners at our grandparents' house. I hope you had a grandparent that did big Sunday dinners because that was one of my favorite things. But we had ours when I was in Alabama in the log cabin. It was a one room cabin that they had added a kitchen and one bedroom onto built in the 1800s. And it had a huge table. I'm going to say it was probably almost as long as the stage in the kitchen, just a big wood table and benches on either side. After and before church, the ladies would gather in the kitchen and cook or bring over their, their meals. We had lots of cousins, uncles, aunts, just the whole big nine yards. But when it was time to eat, the women went outside and let the men eat first. I grew up thinking, well, that's just normal. You eat second. Leighton was so appalled to hear that, even though this all happened 40 and some years ago, um, he said in his family it was the opposite. He said the women ate first and the men argued over who would go last. And he said his grandfather always won. His grandfather always got to be the last. And I just, I said, I, I looked at him and said, you don't even know what I'm preaching on tomorrow, but you just gave me a story. I thought it was so beautiful that, I, that it just gave me goosebumps. That wasn't the family I grew up in. The family I grew up in, not my parents, but the generation before them was the first was the best and the last was looked down upon. That's the way our world tends to work. But one of the ways we know how to live our lives comes from Philippians 2 where Paul gives us an amazing description of who Jesus was. He says things like, Jesus didn't take advantage of his relationship with God to lift himself up. Jesus took on the form of a slave instead of the form of a king as he was entitled. Jesus humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even death on a cross. And we know that at any point, Jesus could have called a halt to all of it. He could have said, no, this is too much. I'm not doing this. But Philippians 2 isn't just about Jesus. It's about the example of Christ that we need to follow. You see, we are supposed to be humble. We are supposed to be obedient. We are supposed to put others first. We are supposed to do whatever we have to do in order to keep unity in our churches. If we approach church membership 
as a way to get what we want from the church. We have it upside down. To rephrase the famous line said by JFK, ask not what your church can do for you, ask what you can do for your church. And if you do that, if you ask yourself that simple question, how can I serve my church? Then you will understand the joy of being last. Would you please stand as we sing our closing song? It may not be as familiar to you, but I think you'll find it an easy one, and the words are just perfect. Would you? to have your meeting. Uh, and now I invite you to join me in our joyous benediction, the trees of the field. You shall go. 